This video is made possible by Skillshare. Learn anything you want to learn with Skillshare for free for two months at skl.sh slash reallifelore19. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 was a scheduled flight on March 8, 2014 that was scheduled to leave from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia at 12.35 a.m. and arrive in Beijing, China at 6.30 a.m. But Flight 370 never arrived in Beijing, and now over four years later since the plane mysteriously vanished, we still don't have an answer for what happened to it or where exactly it currently is. The disappearance of the plane mid-flight and the lack of any conclusive answers has guaranteed that Flight 370 remains the greatest mystery in aviation history. This video is my attempt to give you as much information as possible and to help explain how exactly a plane can go missing in the 21st century. First, the basics. Flight 370 was one of two daily flights operated by Malaysia Airlines that made flights between Kuala Lumpur and Beijing. Flight 370 was scheduled to leave Kuala Lumpur on the 8th of March at 12.35 a.m. and arrive in Beijing at 6.30 a.m. for a total flight time of 5 hours and 34 minutes. The aircraft that was being flown was a Boeing 777 passenger jet that was carrying enough fuel to remain in the air for 7 hours and 31 minutes, more than enough time to make a diversion in the event of an emergency. The plane itself was 11 years old and had no previous incidents of mechanical issues reported. The flight was operated by a crew of 12 people, all of whom were Malaysian citizens and two pilots. The pilot in command was 53-year-old Zahir Ahmad Shah, a longtime employee who had joined Malaysia Airlines back in 1981 and had over 18,000 hours of flight time experience. His co-pilot was 27-year-old Fariq Abdul Hamid, who had been with the company for seven years and had over 2,700 hours of flight experience as well. In addition to these two pilots and 10 other crew members, there was a total of 227 passengers that were on board, 153 Chinese citizens, 50 Malaysians, 7 Indonesians, 6 Australians, 5 Indians, 4 French, 3 Americans, 2 Canadians, 2 Iranians, 2 New Zealanders, 2 Ukrainians, 1 Dutch, 1 Russian, and 1 Taiwanese. Departing slightly later than scheduled, Flight 370 took off from the runway at Kuala Lumpur at 12.42 a.m. and was soon cleared by air traffic control to climb to 18,000 feet in altitude. Subsequent voice analysis has confirmed that the first officer aboard the flight verbally communicated with air traffic control before the flight took off, and that the captain was in communication with them just after taking off. The flight at first continued normally, but at 1.06 a.m. the plane sent its last automated position report and final transmission. The last verbal contact that anybody had with somebody on the flight occurred just moments later at 1.19 a.m., just 37 minutes after the plane had taken off. At that time, Kuala Lumpur radar made a call to the cockpit of the flight telling them to switch over to Vietnam's airspace, saying, Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120.9, good night. This was answered by the head pilot, Captain Shah, when he simply said, good night, Malaysian 370. The plane was now flying over the Gulf of Thailand on its scheduled path, but this is when things start to get weird. Just three minutes after making their final verbal contact with the outside world, at 1.21 a.m., Flight 370 suddenly vanished from the radar screens at both Kuala Lumpur and Ho Chi Minh City. This means that the transponder on board the flight was no longer working at this time. There were very few clouds in the area with no storms, which means it's extremely likely that the transponder was manually turned off by somebody instead. Military radar was still capable of tracking the flight after this point though, and here is what happened next. For whatever reason, the plane began to make a turn right, but then took a sudden left turn to a southwesterly direction. Flight 370 then flew in this direction directly back over the Malay Peninsula fluctuating a few thousand feet in altitude. At 1.52 a.m., Flight 370 was detected to cross just south of Penang Island and then took another turn to fly across the Strait of Malacca. The last location of MH370 known with certainty was about here over the Indian Ocean at 2.22 a.m., which was near the limits of the Malaysian military radar. Despite being lost to radar, the flight was still making satellite communications. Based on an analysis of this satellite data, it has been concluded that MH370 then took another bizarre turn in this general direction and area and continued to fly this way for over five hours. The whole time this part of the trip was happening, the aircraft satellite communication system was responding to hourly status requests from the satellite company Immersat. A phone call was made to
to the cockpit again at 2.39 a.m., which rang but went unanswered by anybody inside. Over four hours later, at 7.13 a.m., another phone call was made to the cockpit, but this time too, it just rang and went unanswered. By 7.24 a.m., while still airborne somewhere over the Indian Ocean, the flight was one hour late past its scheduled arrival in Beijing. The Malaysian government announced that they had lost contact with the plane and that search and rescue operations had been mobilized, but unknown to them at the time, MH370 was still flying. The last piece of data received from the plane happened at 8.19 a.m. It was a logon request sent by the flight to the company Immersat, which would have only happened for a few reasons, namely either a power or a software failure. The plane at this point had been flying for 7 hours and 38 minutes, and since it was only scheduled to fly for 5 and a half hours, it's most likely that the plane had run out of fuel by this point. Immersat sent another status request to the plane at 9.15 a.m., but this time it finally went unanswered. Based on that fact, it's most likely that the plane plane crashed in the Indian Ocean sometime between 819 and 915, but it's still not known exactly where this happened. When the final communication was made with the flight at 8.19 a.m., it's been calculated that the flight was somewhere along this black curve. Taking that into consideration, and the general flight path the plane was taking analyzed from the satellite data, and it's most likely that the plane went down somewhere around here several thousand kilometers west of Australia. So to recap, the plane departed from Kuala Lumpur on the way to Beijing and started flying on the normal flight path, but then made a sudden right turn over the Gulf of Thailand, then a sudden left turn and flew across the Malay Peninsula. Once past the island of Penang, the plane took another turn to fly into the Indian Ocean, and then took another turn south and flew for over five hours straight across that ocean before it probably finally ran out of fuel and crashed somewhere west of Australia in the middle of nowhere. The search for the plane and the 239 people on board began almost immediately. The hunt initially began in Southeast Asia, as it was believed early on that the plane probably went down around here. But as more information came out about the actual path the flight took, the search was changed to the Indian Ocean. Between March 18th and April 28th, 19 ships and 345 sorties by military aircraft searched an area over 4.6 million square kilometers in size, larger than the entire country of India, and found nothing. A sonar search of the seafloor was also conducted about 1,800 kilometers west of Perth, Australia, but also didn't find anything. Nothing at all was actually discovered until over a year after the plane vanished, when in July 2015 a piece of wreckage was discovered washed up on the beach of Reunion, 4,000 kilometers west of the main search area. The piece was a wing flapper on, this part on a plane, and it was confirmed to have come from MH370. Its analysis showed that the landing flaps of the plane were not extended when it crashed, which kind of terrifyingly supports the theory that when the plane crashed in the ocean, it did so by entering into a vertical dive. A few more pieces of wreckage were later discovered across the coast of East Africa, but by January 17th, 2017, nearly three years after the plane's disappearance, the official search for the flight was suspended after discovering no other evidence for the plane's location other than those small amounts of debris. The search was conducted mostly by the governments of Malaysia, Australia, and China, and it had become the most expensive search in aviation history, costing $155 million. The official report from the search claimed to have narrowed down the location of the crash to a 25,000 square kilometer area in the ocean here west of Australia, an area roughly the same size as Macedonia. In January 2018, though, a private U.S. company called Ocean Infinity announced that it would resume the search for the plane in that 25,000 square kilometer area. Area. But as of March 2018, after searching a 33,000 square kilometer area around it, they too have found nothing. After over four years of searching and coming up with few answers, the speculation as to what happened to MH370 has been rampant. We're pretty certain about the path the flight took and the general area of where it crashed, but we're no closer to understanding why it happened. The first major theory that got a lot of early attention was a possible hijacking from passengers on board. There were two men aboard the flight who were Iranian citizens with stolen passports, which raised a considerable amount of suspicion. They had only purchased one-way tickets from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing and only entered Malaysia a week before the flight departed, but Interpol later concluded that both men were simply asylum seekers fleeing Iran, and not terrorists. Neither of them had the relevant skills to have flown a plane and performed a hijacking, and both American and Malaysian officials extensively reviewed the backgrounds of every single passenger named in the flight manifest and came up with no potential leads. There was speculation that the plane could have been hijacked and taken to a remote island, but no 
group to date has ever claimed responsibility for that. And following the discovery of the wreckage off the coast of Africa, this theory has become extremely unlikely. A passenger hijacking doesn't seem likely to have taken place, but what about a crew hijacking? There was considerable suspicion raised around Captain Zahir Ahmad Shah, but no conclusive evidence has been found that links him to causing the incident either. The Malaysian government conducted 170 interviews of friends and family of the crew that were on board, but once again, nothing significant or sinister was discovered through these. If the pilots caused the incident, it's unclear what exactly would have been their motive for doing so. Police searched the homes of both pilots and seized the financial records of all 12 crew members. The FBI even analyzed data from Captain Shaw's home flight simulator, but none of this discovered anything sinister. But remember when the flight took that turn out over the Indian Ocean and flew for five hours until it ran out of fuel? American intelligence officers believed the most likely explanation for that was that someone in the cockpit of Flight 370 manually reprogrammed the aircraft's autopilot before it took that turn. And do you also remember back when Flight 370 first vanished off the radar screens because a transponder stopped working? It's also possible that somebody inside the cockpit manually turned the transponder off. Despite it seeming likely that somebody in the crew was responsible, there's still zero conclusive evidence to prove that that's what actually happened. There's a few other weird theories out there about what went on, ranging from the plane getting sucked into a black hole to getting abducted by aliens. There's also a theory that the plane was hijacked remotely by cyber criminals that gained access to the flight controls, but Boeing has denounced this idea as impossible. The final theory I haven't discussed yet is the fire slash hypoxia theory. It's possible that a fire may have started somewhere on board the plane while en route to Beijing. The theory goes that the pilots decided to turn back and wanted to attempt an emergency landing at the nearest suitable airport in northern Malaysia. Based on an analysis of the timing of the satellite communications data, a power interruption mid-flight would be the most likely reason for it. It's unknown what may have caused a power interruption though, since it's been ruled out that it was an engine issue. It could have been somebody inside manually switching off the aircraft's electrical system, but who knows why that would have happened. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau concluded that an unresponsive crew resulting from a potential cabin decompression event was the most likely explanation for when the plane flew for five hours straight across the Indian Ocean. If this happened, then everybody on board the flight would have been unconscious for hours up to when it crashed in the ocean. This is all pretty speculative though, because A, it's unknown what might have caused the decompression event happening, B, it's unknown what might have caused the power interruption happening, and C, even if a fire did happen on board and the crew attempted an emergency landing in Malaysia, why did they continue to fly over Malaysia and then change course out over the Indian Ocean? No matter what theory you might think is most likely, every single one has some holes in it that make any of them seem doubtful. And if it's frustrating for you not knowing any answers, imagine how frustrating it must be for the families and friends of the people that were on board. MH370 remains aviation's greatest unsolved mystery, and as long as we haven't discovered the plane, we probably won't get any answers or closure. It's possible that somebody in the world knows exactly what happened to MH370, and it's also possible that literally nobody in the world knows what happened. But whichever of those two possibilities is real, they're both equally unsettling. Lessons of any kind are valuable for both societies and for individuals, and if you made it all the way through this video to here, it's clear that you enjoy learning. So why not learn even more about anything you want to by going over to Skillshare next? One of the most common questions that I get asked all the time is how I got started making these videos, and the first step was learning the required skills like researching, writing, audio recording, and editing. For all of these skills though, there's a course offered on Skillshare, an online learning community with more than 20,000 classes on whatever it is you want to learn. The sheer variety of classes you can take is incredible. You can learn skills to help you make videos, build a good looking website, or cook a delicious meal, and there is so much more. There's even amazing classes taught by my YouTube friends Mike Boyd and the team behind Kurzgesagt. But the best part about all of this is that the first 500 people to click on the link in the description or by going to skl.sh slash reallifelore19 can try Skillshare entirely for free for two months. Skillshare is a great supporter of this channel and they help make these videos possible and it's a great place to learn, so please do make sure to go ahead and check them out. Thank you and I'll see you again next week.